All right, welcome everyone. Um, this is a time of virtual programming at LSU Museum of Art, and I'm excited to have back um, Martin Payton, who lives in Baton Rouge, part-time, part-time in New Orleans, um, born in New Orleans, but has been a really a long-time resident here and taught at Southern for years and years. And I hope that some of you got to visit um, the exhibition we did in 2017 with Martin. We really focused then on his kind of the last 20 years of his work. So tonight we want to take a little bit of a different approach and um, give Martin the opportunity to talk about his earlier work and his path um, to kind of to his sculptural practice and put that practice in conversation with John Scott. Um, John Scott, a lot of people celebrate his birthday just a few days ago. Um, and what we hope to end with is a discussion of um, the public work spirit house that Martin and John Scott uh, worked on together um, and kind of a call to action as um, the opportunity to go visit a monument that is worth visiting right now. Um, so with that, I um, encourage you to follow along. We're going to have slides so that we can um, share images of Martin's work. And we're going to start with these two works um, that are on view at LSU Museum of Art right now. We have this sculpture on loan as part of our Living with Art exhibit by John Scott. And we also have on view Martin Payton's Night Train, um, which was a piece that we acquired from our 2017 show, Broken Time. And so I would love to just invite Martin, will you start sharing a little bit about Night Train and how it relates to um, how jazz is um, an important influence in your work? Well, uh, first the title, Night Train, T-R-A-N-E, uh, of course, is a reference to, to John Coltrane. And um, uh, being, from, being from New Orleans, I came to understand art as music. Uh, I, I didn't grow up in a home with paintings or sculptures like that, but there were certainly records. And so uh, musicians were, were my, my sort of cultural forebear. And in my attempts to try and connect what I was doing in my own work with what those cultural forebears or those musicians that I admired had been doing, I came upon improvisation as sort of the key. Um, and so that, for many people, improvisation means making it up on the spot, which couldn't be farther from the truth. It actually means that the person came to the spot damn well prepared. In terms of a musician, it meant that the musician had worked and practiced for years and years and years to build up a, 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 a library, if you will, of musical phrases and references in his or her head that uh, they were prepared to, to throw into the mix at a moment's notice. And so that kind of preparation is what made imp improvisation possible. The same is true in terms of a visual artist who, again, has worked to develop the uh, sensitivity about uh, understanding the possibility for connections between forms and, and spaces and shapes uh, so that, again, there's, there's, there's the opportunity to, to, to jump in to, uh, to, to a gap so that things could work. Uh, Night Train, is a piece that's, that's uh, a part of a series of work that I began where I challenged myself to make a sculpture without transforming or changing or uh, altering any of the pieces. In, in other words, going to a scrapyard and pulling in a bunch of pieces of steel and marrying those pieces of steel to each other just as they existed. So for me, uh, that was success in making a sculpture. And you see the same thing happening in the sculpture of Scott's on the right. Uh, the piece on the right uh, by Scott, of course, is a kinetic piece. And uh, it's, it's based on uh, wave physics. And um, so uh, all of the elements, if you stretch a line and, and suspend a number of elements on the line, each of those elements moving affects the movement of others. So there's improvisation in terms of the development of the forms in the sculpture. And there's also improvisation in terms of how the movement actually works. Yeah. <laughs> Excuse me. Um, I know an important thing for both you and John Scott was referencing so many things, the present, 
the past, um, the history, your ancestors. Um, so I think a good place to start when we can keep moving through this conversation is to talk about where you met, which is um, Xavier and some of your early influences. And I know that you and John Scott both shared influences. Yes, on the left, uh, well, in both of these images, you see Sister Lorena Neely, who's um, a sister in the order of the Nuns of the Blessed Sacrament. Of course, that, that order was put together by Catherine Drexel of the, of the uh, Pennsylvania Drexel family, uh, who decided that she would, um, uh, she did not want to live the life of a debutante as was, would have been possible by the, uh, the wealth of her family, but she wanted to dedicate her life to something that was, that was, worth, uh, that was worth living about. Now, the story goes that she had an audience with the Pope and complained to the Pope about the treatment of uh, African Americans and Native Americans, and the Pope said, hey, look, if you see a problem, solve it. So she took her inheritance and founded this order of nuns, and they went from their Philadelphia base throughout the southern and southeastern and southwestern United States. And Sister Lorena was one of those uh, people. She studied at Catholic University in Washington, D.C., uh, along with David Driscoll. He was there at the same time. Uh, her sculpture was ecclesiastical, but it was, it was heavily tinged with all of the latest modernist uh, ideas and techniques. Uh, she was not only a sculptor in, in wood by carving, she was a ceramic artist. Uh, she did graphic design. She did amazing things with lettering and layout and poster design. I mean, she, uh, she was a painter. <laughs> so incredible, an incredible, incredible artist. And she formed a, a guild system for her students at the time when Frank Hayden and John Scott were there as students. And that guild system gave them the opportunity to, uh, to go after commissions and they executed commissions throughout the, the Southern uh, United States, Southern and Eastern United States um, as students. Um, so, so it was a great proving ground. Uh, it was a great uh, training ground for them so that when they walked out of Xavier, they were already professional artists. I'm glad you mentioned Frank Hayden because he was there concurrently with John Scott and I just wonder I want to plug LASM has a, an exhibition of Frank Hayden's work that I'm really excited to go see. Um, and a lot of what's been published about, or what's been published in the Advocate are the social justice themes of his work. And I know you could have that discussion about your work and John Scott's. Was that part of your, part of the conversation then, even if by another name? Absolutely, absolutely. And, and, and I want to make sure to mention that that this nun was a, uh, a mentor for Frank Hayden as well. Uh, and if I wish there were an opportunity to see the things that she did with, with, with lettering, uh, with letter forms, because you can see in that where Frank Hayden was birthed in terms of the way he uses letter forms in his, in, in, in his own sculpture. So I feel incredibly privileged to have uh, had the opportunity to have been mentored and taught by the same person who uh, was responsible for the powerful careers of Frank Hayden and John Scott. Uh, on the left, you see a, a photograph of Numa Rusev, who was the art historian and painter uh, at Xavier when I was a student there. Um, Numa Rusev's brother, Ferdinand Rusev, was an architect and he actually uh, created the art department at Xavier. And, uh, but Numa Rusev actually taught alongside of Sister Lorraine and Neely, uh, again, in, in painting and in art history. And that's, uh, that's the painting of his that, that he's, uh, he's pictured with. On and the right is, um, go ahead. Oh, I'm sorry. I was going to ask, did you, I was going to just lead into learning about oxyacetylene um, welding. Oh, yes. On the right, I um, mean, uh, that's, that's, that's from 1973. <laughs> and uh, I was in Scott's sculpture class and he was teaching me oxygen acetylene welding. And uh, oxygen acetylene welding is a process 
that uses the two gases, oxygen and acetylene, and pressurized tanks, and they're, they're uh, mixed together so that they create what's called a neutral flame. And this neutral flame is used to, to, to weld metal. Now this sculpture that's, uh, that's obviously a, a mother and child, female figure, mother and child, was made uh, with welding rods, uh, three eighths inch welding rods uh, that, that were first made into an armature and then um, covered and then puddled to form the skin that you see. The person standing there with me is uh, Reverend Moses Anderson, who was the chaplain at Xavier at the time. And, and the very, uh, uh, he collected much, many Frank Hayden works, uh, my work, John Scott's, he, he was, he was a, a very interested collector. And then now we have John Scott, just an image for everyone's reference. You've told me that he is the source um, and was just such a strong mentor. Absolutely. No John, Scott, no, no John Scott, no Martin Payton. Absolutely. Absolutely. When I, uh, I met Scott in, in 67 as a freshman in his design class and uh, he was, he was such a powerful exponent of uh, imagery that, that had content, that, that had meaning. And from 67 until 2001, when the Arts Council put out a call for the Desai Circle site, Scott lamented the fact that there was no monument to the contributions that African Americans made to the building and culture of New Orleans, which is absurd. And over those years, I watched him create many iterations of a form that would speak to that. And Spirit House just happened to be the latest one. Spirit House uh, was what he was thinking when the possibility presented itself. So the Arts Council making that call in 2001 for the Desai Circle uh, uh, space was a, was a was opportunity and preparation meeting. This is an early work of yours. I know you've told um, me. Here's, uh, oh, sorry, Martin. Go ahead. No, please. No, I just was going to say to you have told me the story of how you weren't initially planning to be a sculptor. Um, and this is a, a piece, a two dimensional piece of work <laughs> for you, where you can see, but it's also in conversation with the series um, that John Scott had going in the 70s. That's true. I want to talk about Scott's piece first on the right. Uh, you can see that it's a box and the box has many things in it. You see a sort of a, a cast form of an apple at the top. You see uh, there's, there's actually a, a nipple on the right that's, that's shielded by a nail and, and that other form. And he's, he's talking about uh, Soweto uh, in South Africa where, where the people were not able to access the, the materials and resources of their own country where they were barred from that. And the box forms that he used would sometimes included castings of baby doll heads representing the people. Uh, he compared them to the box cars that were used in Nazi Germany to, uh, to, to transport people of, of, of the Jewish faith to those concentration camps. Uh, and so Soweto, on, on the right, I'm responding to that. I've drawn my own baby doll head, that's in color pencil, but I've broken it up because I'm already interested in trying to find uh, a way of, of presenting improvisation in the work. And of course the hot dog, uh, you know, and the raisin bread represents American popular culture. Uh, you can see the little scratches, the little swath on the left-hand side of the figure of the baby's head and a line going down from it to the word flesh. That was a colored pencil that was labeled flesh. So, so all of these things, uh, the baby doll's head is obviously in, in disrepair. It, it, it has, has, been, has been sort of battered, right? And my title is a riff on Scott's Soweto saying, so we too. So Scott has always been an influence on my work. 
here I'm in Los Angeles. Um, this is after grad school and I had sort of painted my way. I went to the Otis Art Institute in Los Angeles because the artist Charles White was there. And I thought that I would go learn how to do what Charles White did and come back to, to Louisiana and be a baby Charles White. <laughs> of course, that was a ridiculous notion in itself, but meeting Charles White and, 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 and seeing that personality made me understand that uh, that's where that work came from. And, and I wasn't the same, so I had to find my own voice. And here I'm breaking painting down on the left into flat colors. Uh, and I'm, I'm trying to create illusions of space and form using flat, hard edge painting. Uh, I'm already on the way to sculpture. I didn't know it then, but, but obviously I'm, I'm implying form and space and space itself. The drawing on the right is, uh, is a color pencil rendering that predates the one that we talked about uh, in, in, in the last segment there, so we too. But again, it's playing with the same ideas as that painting. So, so I'm inching my way towards sculpture here. Inching a little farther here. <laughs> That's beautiful. <laughs> well, uh, now I'm in New Orleans and- um, Beautiful. And the hard edge is gone. And I'm literally, literally throwing the paint at the canvas, trying to, uh, trying to bring in improvisation, trying to bring in chance, trying to challenge myself to create on the fly. Uh, this is a painting uh, that began on canvas that was obviously a, he uh, a hexagon. Mm -hmm. I'm sorry, an octagon and, uh, well, a hexagon, I'm sorry. Anyway, <laughs> I cut it out of the uh, stretcher and added grommets and flew it in the space as a, as a sort of kite. Uh, I'm really, really interested in getting into three-dimensional space here, uh, but the only technology I know is painting technology. And so, you're back in New so Orleans I'm now? doing what I can with what I got. This is at Xavier University. I'm teaching painting there, yes. This is a big moment um, where you learned arc welding. Absolutely. I, I, I was... I taught at Xavier for, from 1976 to 1981. And the year 1980, I became chair of the department. And that was distressing enough for me so that I thought about taking a welding course and getting a job in a shipyard. <laughs> so uh, that, thank God that didn't happen, but I took the welding course. It was a six month welding course. And it brought me to a material that I had not had a history with, the way I had with painting. So I was able to come to it free. Uh, this happened because Scott invited me to uh, go to a steel yard with him. He was going to collect some steel for himself to make sculpture. And he was interested in steel plate. I uh, saw I-beams laying around. And so I gathered uh, as many I-beams as I could and brought them back to Xavier and uh, had had not yet taken the welding course, but I was just interested in these linear forms. Mm -hmm. And um, once I took the welding course and learned to manipulate them, I decided I wanted to organicize them. I knew artists uh, who had worked with, uh, with, with industrial steel uh, members and used them just as they were used in industry, but I didn't want to do that. I wanted to organicize them. So I bent them. I learned the techniques that it took to actually bend, bend these forms. And uh, further, this piece is kinetic. You can see the spring there at its center. Uh, it's 12 feet high and it's called Bambula for, uh, it's a reference to Congo Square in New Orleans. So this is my, that was my first uh, mature sculpture. And you see in On the- On the left is a piece called Mahalia that- Oh, go ahead. Me? No, go ahead, Martin, sorry. On the, left, on the left is a piece called Mahalia that from 1984. Uh, this is after leaving Xavier. I was, uh, I was teaching in the, in the public schools in Orleans and Jefferson Parish and working under the house that, uh, that I lived in there. Um, 
You can see the cutouts here. I'm still fabricating. I'm very much fabricating and cutting shapes out of the steel. Of course, the shapes that I'm cutting are references to Africa. You can see the, the sort of uh, crocodile form in front of the piece there that's uh, rendered in the Yoruba style, as well as the woman as support figure that you see cut through the, the, the member, the central large beam. Um, on the right-hand side is a piece called West from a little later, 1987. That piece was actually made in my studio in Tallahassee when I was teaching at Florida A&M, or FAMU. And West was uh, an early improvisational piece. It was made from cutouts that were left over from other pieces that I was doing. If you look at that, that uh, diamond in West, and at the base of West, and then go to the next slide, yeah, uh, this is a piece called Little Esther, and you can see the diamond shapes there. So I had lots of uh, solid diamond shapes, as well mm -hmm. as many other shapes, where you see that I've rounded the ends of the beams. That meant that I had shapes like that, that were drops, that were left over from those fabrications. And all of those began to go into actual improvisations. Right, and we'll talk about later, you kind of stopped fabricating and only using, started only using the pieces that we had in our show in 2017, the Broken Time Show, or only as they were found, a complete kind of step away from fabrication. And another important point about this, this, uh, these two images is that one is painted uh, and one is not. And uh, at that time, I, I believed that I needed to, to paint the work. I, I believed that I needed the work to be protected by paint and uh, of course, in, in the 70s and 80s, uh, painting was, was du jour in sculpture, you know, and, uh, but then looking at the work now, it's kind of embarrassing, you know, this, this kind of looks like Candyland. <laughs> <laughs> and and in, in my mind, uh, this really took away the, uh, took away the gravitas of the work and, and sort of plasticized it. In the, in the, in the far, in, in the far, uh, farthest par point away from us in this photograph is a sculpture called Ellington, which was purchased by uh, Frederick Wiseman and, and uh, donated to the New Orleans Museum of Art in uh, 1988. Let's see, next one. So here we see where you shifted from leaving them unpainted. Here I've, I've, I've decided that it's it's silly to paint these things. And uh, I mean, they're made of scrap steel and, and uh, I'm, I'm more interested in being honest here. Um, I'm cutting really... things out. Sorry. I'm still cutting out, I'm still cutting shapes out. The piece on the left is called Bethune, obviously a reference to a very important woman in, in, in African-American history. And um, it also sends a, uh, sends a, a relationship to, to the Egyptian culture, as you can see with the, with the sort of crown that that, that figure is wearing. You can see right really hand, clearly the bend you made in the I-beam. I'm trying to organicize, I'm trying to organicize. That was, that was part of the point of cutting these images into it, was to organicize it and not have it not have it be sort of uh, coldly impersonal uh, as, as, as in minimal art. And then these two pieces are totally uh, improvised. The piece Passport on the left was made in my studio on the Hemicourt Street in New Orleans in 2004, just before Katrina. And on the right, uh, many of the elements in that piece were uh, Christmas presents from Mapo. Um, she would uh, she would get these these pieces of steel and uh, and and bring them to my studio and 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 drop them off you know and they they were they were they were they were well timed and uh, they were important triggers in in the formation of of, of a lot of these these works that uh, that were improvised. And and before you know you were cutting out these forms that reference history or cultural figures and now is really the history kind of inheres in the object from the labor um, that these pieces may have been used from or the life that they live to be worn and broken down into fragments. Exactly, um, exactly. Yeah. 
So I think now, I think this is the moment we get to see Spirit House. And this is just such an amazing piece. And I would encourage people to go visit it. It's at the intersection of um, St. Bernard. Oh, wait, Martin, you're going to have to help me. I already forgot. St. Bernard, say and Gentilly Boulevard. Gentilly Boulevard. Yes, uh, yeah. And I love the story of this development of this piece and, and your relationship with John Scott. So I think if you'll just start giving us an overview of the concept for the overall structure. Well, there weren't, I, I don't know that, that any, any black artists had, had, had the opportunity to, to create public work in New Orleans at that point. And there was actually a meeting uh, that was, that was uh, initiated by Cheryl Hayes, who was then teaching at Dillard University, a meeting at Scott's studio, because she knew about this call that was going to go out. And, uh, and it was about trying to position uh, a black artists to get an opportunity to participate in this, in this, in this call, in this commission. So um, Scott and I partnered and uh, decided to go after the commission together. And um, the first meeting that we had, Scott made a sketch of a shotgun house on flying buttresses. And this was the opportunity at long last to create a monument that would speak to the contributions of black people to the culture and, and the building of the city of New Orleans. So why flying buttresses and a shotgun? Well, the shotgun form comes from the Congo through the Caribbean and into the United States. Uh, the, not, you know, not the gable that we see, but uh, the pitched roof and uh, the, the sort of uh, uh, single axis form that the shotgun exists as. In fact, it's called the shotgun, of course, because uh, the, the myth goes that you could shoot a shotgun through the house and not hit any of the walls, right? And um, so that represented the African side and then the flying buttresses. Well, the history of Louisiana, you know, you're talking about African, French, and Spanish. English come later. And French and Spanish are connected by Catholicism. So mm -hmm. those the flying buttresses from those cathedrals, those uh, cathedrals that started going up, uh, seem to be a, a great visual architectural metaphor for, for African American, which is a clash or a, a, a collision between African and European culture. So Scott literally had this form in his head from Jump Street. And that was supposed to be the piece, uh, the flying, uh, the, the shotgun supported by the flying buttresses sitting on the ground. But when you do a public work, you have to deal with the city planning commission. <laughs> and the city planning commission felt that it was climbable as it existed. So they nixed it and said we needed to do something. And uh, Scott came up with the idea of the six foot high pylons so that it sits on top of those, which means that it's not climbable anymore. But an added uh, uh, advantage is that now it's a cathedral. It's literally a cathedral. You can walk into and under it. And those pylons uh, uh, gave the opportunity to have, have plaques placed on the backs of each of them, which explain all of the imagery in the piece. Now, the piece is situated between two schools, Nelson right. Elementary, which is a public school, and St. Leo the Great, which is a Catholic school. So we began by going to those two schools, their elementary schools, and speaking to the, the children about uh, what we were trying to do. And the question was, what is an African-American? And what contributions did African-Americans make to the city of New Orleans? And what did your parents and grandparents do as, as, in, as for employment, for, for earning a living? And we asked the children to make drawings of, of the occupations of their parents and grandparents. And we got things as variegated as uh, Tootie Montana's granddaughter. Tootie Montana was one of the most important of the uh, contemporary Mardi Gras Indians uh, who drew a, an image of a Mardi Gras Indian. So kids who drew uh, car repair people and teachers and cooks and musicians and all of those things. And the children's images got blown up 
and cut out of the, uh, the front and back ends of the shotgun form so that the community, uh, I mean, these, these, these babies in elementary school would grow up with this piece and the community would, would, would take, uh, would take uh, you know, would, would accept the piece and, and take authorship of the piece, not just now, but into the future. Scott also insisted that the piece be oriented north and south in its axis so that when the sun rose in the east in the morning, the shadow of the uh, structure would be pushed to the west, which, which meant our enslavement and oppression. And when the sun set in the west, that shadow would migrate back to the east, signifying a return, a return home. And uh, the, the entire thing is just an incredible, an incredible conception. And of course, you have the, the, the words of the poem that Scott wrote. The roof of this sculpture is literally a poem. I'll show the other Shadow one. Shadow of a long day, no oh, rest sorry. from working day into night. Deep, no rest from working deep into night, seeking a peaceful place alone, wrapped in, only in the dream, wrapped only in their in, the, in their dreams, cooled by the breeze of their children's dream. I'm sorry, I, I mangled that. No, I think I clicked the but screen I'm, on I'm, you. I think, I think everybody else can see the entire, I think everybody else can see the entire poem. Remember to the, remember whose back support you during the horizon of your today. The ancestor shadow gives us refuge from ignorance. We come from builders of cities, culture, and knowledge. And then I so just that's uh, this 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 piece was John Scott's conception, and it had been his conception for some thirty years before this possibility ever existed. I I aided him in the construction and fabrication of the piece. And then in here we can see the reference to the Middle Passage, um, Absolutely. under the cathedral. Those those are interesting. Those 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 figures inside chained together carrying those burdens, also have images of, of masks from uh, different African cultures on their heads. So the point of that is, is we came here in bondage, enslaved, but we did not come empty handed. We brought our culture, we brought our culture with us and, and in cities like New Orleans and many, many cities around the South, particularly in the South, and, and of course, scattered across the country once the migrations happened um, after the wars, uh, you see African retentions everywhere in America. I think this is the final image. I just wanted to show a comparison of the cutouts in, in your work and the cutout in this piece since you were so involved in doing the cutouts and the actual um, fabrication. I, exactly. um, I think we'll kick off the Q&A, but I want to start with just asking you to speak about the importance of working with the community and getting buy-in and involving the kids in the drawing and kind of how you felt about that because it was kind of outside of your normal practice or what it kind of added to your practice to do that. Yeah, if, if, if you're going, you, you, you should not put something in the public space without giving the people who have to live with that thing an opportunity to speak on whether they want to be involved with it or not. So, uh, and, and that's, that's, that's so relevant. That's so relevant today. I mean, I just uh, read an article on my feed about uh, a sculpture on the campus of Ole Miss that, uh, that's in, in, in great contention today. I mean, I think a quarter of the students at the school are, 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 are black students and, um, and we have this we have the sculpture there that that was not put up during the time of the civil war but it was put up after reconstruction as a as a means of uh, reinforcing uh, white supremacy and uh, you know that's 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 a great example of what should not be done uh, what you just uh, you know connect, connecting to the question you just asked well, um, does anyone else have questions? If you enter them in the chat or if you physically raise your hand, we'll try to catch it. Or if you wanna use the raise your hand function built into to Zoom, um, Grant and I are looking and we'll try to get you in.
I can't see if anyone. Well, no one has any questions. Has any, I want to know if anyone's been to Spirit House and just um, what that experience was like. If anyone's willing to speak about that. Uh, um, we have a question from the, um, from the chat um, asking for you to talk about your relationship with other important artists, Martin. My relationship with other important artists. Um, I'm not sure how to, I'm not sure how to answer From that question. From <laughs> <laughs> well, I'm, I'm, I mean, I'm thinking of, I mean, because you, you actually had the opportunity to, you know, know a lot of artists throughout your career and you've influenced them as well as in some ways they've influenced you. So I just thought you would want to talk about it. Well, I, I, I wonder about that. I know I have been, I know I have been influenced, uh, uh, you know, there, there are some, I mean, I think immediately of Clifton Webb, who, who uh, got both of his degrees there at LSU, and who's, a, who's an incredible sculptor. Um, it, he, John Scott and I sort of, in the 70s, we sort of uh, forged our our artistic identities together. Uh, there weren't any galleries uh, that were, were showing our work or anything. And so we were sort of on our own. We, um, we, we met together and at each other's studios, uh, sharing uh, the work and the ideas that we were trying to put together and uh, developed our voices uh, that way. So you know, like that, like that. I think, um, I think Mapo and I have influenced each other in, in, in many ways over the years in terms of the work that, uh, in terms of the work that we, uh, the work that we do. Um, yeah, I mean, there's a, there's, there's, there's a whole, there's a whole community of artists that are important. I mean, uh, the artist David Hammonds uh, has been important to me uh, in terms of uh, how he manage, manages to to construct work that that is not made of any kind of precious materials or does or that doesn't even um, uh, make a nod to any kind of permanence in terms of of, 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 of materials or stance and uh, has has consciously avoided uh, uh, the whole art structure, if you will, and, and yet has managed to, uh, to create a body of work that, that, is, that is highly respected among, among uh, his peers and, and people who are aware of him. So yeah, there, I mean, I mean it's, 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 a, it's a fraternity that goes, it's, well, I, fraternity is a bad word to use here. It's, it's, a, it's a community, let me say that. <laughs> It's a community that that goes all the way back to to Paleolithic times. I mean, when I'm in the studio, I feel like I'm in conversation with everybody who's ever made anything. From the caves to today, yeah. I remember you telling me that. Um, we have a question about where you That's find right. your current yeah. inspiration. Well, again, uh, music has always been art for me and you know when when you look at it the american soundtrack imagine the american soundtrack without the influence of of of, of african-american culture right i'm gonna I make mean, sure that would be That would be real. That would be real, 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 real different. So I'm. I, I feel like, I feel like Black American musicians were able to hold on to African culture in ways that writers, visual artists, never were, or well, at least weren't until say the period of the Harlem Renaissance when they began to have a consciousness about that. But the musicians always held on to that stream. 
and uh, and and because of that, they they really took the they really took the forefront in terms of this culture. I mean, people people understood New Orleans based on what Sidney Bechet and Louis Armstrong did, what they accomplished, and people understood uh, Black American and by proxy American music by what. Again, those same artists, King Oliver, you know, all of those folk, uh, 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 Bessie Smith, I mean, all of them, you know, as they moved around the country and spread this, this information and uh, uh, affected the music of the world. So, so that's, that's, that's plenty of reference for me. And, and I can, uh, I've worked off that all my all my career and uh, it'll probably take me to the take me to the grave. Yeah, one of our, um, Daniel asked about your titles which reference often jazz musicians and we had a whole section kind of that we focused on in the in the Broken Time exhibit about homage um, in your work. Um, other than jazz musicians, what other um, figures come up in your in your titles? Well, well, lots of figures. I mean, you know, Bethune was was one that we looked at today, and of course, um, Mary McLeod Bethune and uh, her her insistence on education and, and making that making education available for for uh, for for black students, uh, forming Bethune Cookman, eventually forming Bethune Cookman College. Um, there's a reference in the exhibition that I did with you guys to Emmett Till that again goes to the history of, of oppression. Um, the story of Emmett Till um, happened in 1955 when I was seven. And at seven then I was brought to political consciousness by that. Um, that, that taught me that my designation in this country was that of other. And so uh, that spurred me on to do research into African and African American culture to understand exactly why and, 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 um, and how I could make sense of that. And of course that led me to uh, away from ignorance and shame to, to pride and determination. I, um, I don't see any other questions popping up. I... I um, want to share with everyone, I've listed um, in the chat a link to our, the Martin Payton website that we had in 2017, and it has a playlist that you created, um, Martin, that's kind of like your studio set. Um, mm -hmm. And we also are sharing the book that we published in 2017, making it available online um, for people to read. And those essays really get into a lot of the things that we were just talking about, the connections to kind of African symbolism, African American history. Um, there are three essays by Kalamu Salam, um, Joyce Jackson, who teaches at LSU, and Alois Johnson, who taught at Southern um, as an art historian. So if you want to learn more about Martin's work, um, I would encourage you to check out that um, book that's available online for reading now. Is there, um, is there, oh, we have one more question, which is how to inspire students. Um, other materials used for sculpture while experimenting with form and expression. Mr. Payton, <laughs> he's known me for a very <laughs> long time. Go ahead. Absolutely. I'm sorry. Um, I teach middle school students, but I'm privileged to teach them both sculpture and ceramics. Um, but at this oh. time, because of the bubble that we're in, figuring out ways to inspire them with the yeah. materials they may have at home is, is very different from what we do in the classroom and the materials that I've gathered over many years. But what would you say for yeah. an instructor as far as promoting inspiration? Um, and my other question. Well, information, information, everything is made from information, as you know. And so it's, it's a matter of if you're online, you've, you've, you're charged with exposing them to, to as much in terms of imagery and, and history uh, as you possibly can so that they get to see 
Uh, they get to see Elizabeth Catlett. They get to see, um, you know, uh, all of these sculpt at, at John Scott. They get to see Frank Hayden. Uh, they get to see Richmond Barthé. They get to see, you know, Elizabeth Prophet. They get to see all of these people and, and the work that they produce so that that becomes a sense of inspiration. And then choosing materials that they have right at home, whether, whether they're cutting out cardboard shapes and uh, slotting those cardboard shapes together to make forms and, and then painting those forms or coloring them. And I mean, there, there are lots of ways to, to approach it. Yeah, but I didn't catch the second part of your question. It was just asking what other materials did you use while you were experimenting with form and expression? Uh, I'm, I know you didn't just jump straight into using your, your beams. Um, so what did you play around with a little bit? I kind of did. Oh, wow. I kind of, I kind of <laughs> did, but it's, uh, <laughs> but, but you know, I, T today, I make models using cardboard. Okay. You let a you great know, activity um, because with Because it's, 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 yeah, yeah. It's an easy material to use. And I think there's a reference to that on, 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 on you guys' web, isn't, isn't it? Um, I'm not sure you did cardboard the with that. I, with I remember you doing cardboard with high school students. High school to work in a, a group, of course, that's not really possible right now. And then in the gallery, we had people, um, we took just from like our preparators hardware room, we took a lot of found metal hardware pieces and used magnets to create sculptures. Um, and people did that in the gallery. And that was a good way to replicate kind of the found nature. Um, you kind of need strong magnets though. So I don't know how many people have those around, but that was something that, that we encouraged in the gallery to promote it. Thank you. You'd be surprised that you'd be surprised that you surprised that young people's imaginations. I mean, once once their imaginations are fired, they can look around them and see what material, whatever materials are available, and think of how to convert those materials into three dimensional forms. So it's it's, it's not always up to you as a teacher to say. Well, here are, the, here are the materials you should use because maybe those materials in your mind aren't available to the student. But whatever materials they have at hand gives them an opportunity to be, to be creative, to use that big brain and, and design, their own, design their own materials. This is a difficult time, yes. The, the final question that's come in, I think, for our uh, tonight's session is, how is this current political moment affecting your thinking? This is, this is, this is, this is depressing and encouraging because, again, the, the, the Chinese proverb that says, Crisis and opportunity are flip sides of the same coin, and we see this. We see this incredibly treacherous uh, administration actually destroying itself of its of its own of its own arrogance and ignorance, and and that arrogance and ignorance are as responsible as anything else for the resurgence of political awareness among the American people. And so that gives me hope that, that we're, going to, we're going to crush this and, and make, a, make a better society. This, this, this experiment uh, called America has never been up to its promise. We've moved by slow degrees. And we move forward a bit and then we move backwards. We move forward a bit and we move backwards. We move forward a bit and we move backwards. That seems to be the course that these things take. But because of the really dastardly things that this administration is doing, 
I think we're going to have a, I think we're going to have a backlash on the positive side. Uh, well, one great example is here in Louisiana. I was never so proud of, of being in Louisiana as I was when John Bell Edwards gets elected governor. And I'm so happy we have four more years with him at the helm because he's a person who seems to have, to be able to get it right. But Louisiana is a red state. So John Bell Edwards happened because of the administration of Bobby Jindal before him that tore the state down to the point, I mean, in education, in business, in, in every aspect, that people look for something completely different. And I think the Trump administration is inspiring the same thing. Well, we're coming up on almost an hour we've been going. <laughs> I was shooting for, for 30 minutes, but I'm so glad wow. that, wow. that you spent so much time with us tonight. I'm so glad that you spend so much time with me just chatting when we're not doing programmings together um, and that you've shared your work with us and it's part of our museum. And I hope people will come and see. We actually have two pieces of Martin's out right now. We have added um, a piece called Sengbe um, that of course references resistance. Um, on the sh famous ship um, in our silver gallery as part of the discussion about how so much of that silver came in um, to kind of complement the discussion about silver coming in as, as a result of the Haitian revolution. Um, and I just appreciate you sharing um, with us at this time um, about your practice and the history of your practice. And so I hope everyone will come see Martin's work at the museum and go visit the um, Spirit House in New Orleans. And um, I just want to thank you. We can't really clap as we would if we were in the gallery, Martin. Um, <laughs> thank you so much. And I want to let everyone know that, that our next talk will be um, July 19th on a Sunday at 2 o'clock with artist Katrina Andre. We're going to focus on a piece of hers that entered our collection. So um, that'll be our next artist talk, and we'll do more in August. So thank you all. And thank you, Martin. Thank you. That was terrific. Yeah. Thank you. You can buy the catalog at our thank gift you. shop and look at it online, Courtney. <laughs> All right. Martin, thank you, man. <laughs> awesome to see you. Everyone, take care. Thank you, Courtney. Bye, Martin. Hey. Thanks for sharing Bye. this link on Facebook, Mopo. That was great. I was like, oh. Thanks, Martin. Oh, my goodness. Oh, oh. my goodness, Martin. <laughs> <laughs> Great, to you you. Great to see you. <laughs> oh, it's so good to see everyone. It's so good to see you, Martin and Mapo. Yeah. All right. Yes. Thank you, Mapo, <laughs> for the question. Wow. Thank you. This is great. Thanks. All right. Bye. Bye.